it is a blessing to be in a place that you are where you have such learned professors studying the Bible, learning how to interpret the Bible, learning how to imply, apply the Bible. A lot of people don't know and don't usually say this when they introduce me, but I went to the seminary too. I went to the seminary of dubious exegesis, sometimes called SDE. And I just want to share a few things that I did learn there. So you know in the New Testament where it says that our bodies are a temple, a temple. Do you realize that means we're all really Hindu? Also, it is, uh, if you do careful biblical interpretation, you learn a couple of things. For example, that during biblical times, people were much smaller, which kind of fits. We figure that we've gotten bigger, but we see evidence in the Bible of that. But shockingly, that at least some people had cars because it says that in the Bible that the apostles were all in one accord. <laughs> and then finally, one more bit of wisdom in my study. Tennis, that game, is often credited as having begun a few centuries ago in what we can all call Great Britain. But I am quite sure it goes further back to the Old Testament times, for it says in Genesis that Joseph served in Pharaoh's court. All right, so that is my education at the seminary of dubious exegesis. One thing that is not dubious is God has called us here today. I'm going to go down what feels like a heavy road, but it's a time of celebration. And I hope to lead us to that at the end. So if I come with a lot of information, I hope you'll just digest what you can. Um, if you need the PowerPoint or want the PowerPoint, we can make that available. So don't take notes. Let me see if I can make this advance here. Oh, which way do I point it on? There we go. Okay, so our, our verse for today, and I'm just going to be moving around so I can read too, as you are. This verse, of course, is in the context of putting on the full armor of God. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. As Christians, this is what we face every day, the devil, the twister, the divider, the destroyer. And what I want to do is show how the devil has taken a concept called race, twisted it, used it to separate us, and is working every day at multiple levels to try and mess with us. Our challenge, our great challenge that God gives us is to overcome it. So let's just start with this. I often like to show this picture. For all of us, really, when we think about a concept like race, we know our own experience. And so we know the tip of the iceberg. The more that we learn from others, the more we study, we realize just how profound and deep it is historically, within our culture, within our laws. So I use this term, as others do, called a racialized society, that the U.S. and a few other societies around the world are, at their essence, racialized because they formed at a time when this concept race started to have major world play. So we can define it like this. Race matters profoundly for our differences in our life experiences, the opportunities, and social relationships. Who will marry is not just a random thing, but is very much shaped by the racial category we belong to. Ultimately, it always means this, that rewards, whatever those are, are allocated unequally by racial group. So... How we've traditionally thought about race is this. More society's rewards and less. And the classic bookends of blacks and whites in our past. But as we become more diverse, this hasn't been enough to capture race in America today. So we've added a second component. And this is the perception of are you perceived as foreign or American? Then we can still put people along the rankings of how much rewards is given but there's also this sense of foreignness. So for Asians and Hispanics, even if you're U.S. born, you're often perceived as foreign. Mexicans in particular, at least three times in U.S. history, when things haven't been going well, have been sent back to Mexico, even if they were American citizens because they were perceived as foreign. One group that doesn't even get on this category is Native Americans. So that's a whole other reality. Good, I'm not blocking anybody here. All right, so what I just showed you, we can see in multiple ways by looking at some data. This looks at what males make income-wise from 1990 through 2008, our latest. And you can see that there are 
two major categories here. So at the top end, we have uh, whites and Asians very, making very similar males, and then African Americans and Hispanics. Now I want you to focus on the Asians being that close because this next chart, you, you'll wonder why. And as an educator, I don't like this chart. Differential returns on education. How much money do you make by going to school? Okay, so we have white, black, Latino, Native American, Asian. They're in that order every time. And you see, the more education you get, the more money you make. But we also see that there's one exception to a, what's pretty much a general rule. It's if you're white, no matter how much education, you make more than the people of your same education in other groups. The gap actually is not greatest here, but it's what we all are. Okay? And there's all sorts of reasons for that. But the reason that Asians are able to have income similar to whites is that they are more often concentrated here compared to Anglos in this country. Now, if you look at these folks, these are uh, pictures of the richest Americans. And being a sociologist, I do weird things. So I actually went and took the Forbes 400 list of the richest Americans and classified them into racial categories, either by what they listed in their bio or what other people said. And if you take the 400 richest Americans and put them into racial categories, here's how it breaks down. 387 white, nine are Asian, three are Hispanic, one is African American, that's Oprah Winfrey, and none are Native American. So for several years, I've been trying to capture and figure out how does race matter in our culture? And so when I find multiple studies in a particular area that find the same thing, that race matters, then I record it and I put it on this chart. So I'm just going to have them come up so you can read them slowly. These are all areas that race impacts our culture in 2012. Okay, so thankfully we ran out of space, otherwise we probably could have more on there. So, you know, some are just interesting, they're just differences, TV watching. What we watch on TV, even that comes down to even the commercials, even if you're advertising the same thing, the commercials are different depending on who they think is watching, if it's black, white, Hispanic, Asian. And some are very much, you know, obviously very serious, how long we will live, how we will die. But these are multiple areas in which it matters. Now. What I want to do is say, how does, it, how does this happen? How does some of this happen? And so I have four steps that today is the way that race operates. So if I was a real preacher, I know I would have only three points there, but <laughs> at least I made them rhyme. So here we go. <laughs> we got to decolorate, step one. We segregate, we incarcerate, and we alienate. And I want to go through each of these to show you a little bit about how they work. So decolorate is what we call the colorblind ideology. That is the idea that not only should race not matter, but we're not going to talk about it anymore. It, it's off the table. What's really interesting is this is talked mostly by white Americans, and you did not see white Americans talking in this way before the 1960s. It's actually an outgrowth of the civil rights movement, taking things like Martin Luther King saying, we want to be judged by the content of our character, not the color of our skin. So it's, it's, it's out of that idea, but we're going to see that some of the implications of the way that it has been uh, actually portrayed and used in modern times. It came firm hold in the 1980s as sort of government policies in the way that you can discuss race. Um, I often do it with pictures. It's the idea that race is all behind us. And the second component of colorblindness is we hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. We will simply not talk about it, see it, hear it. Now, that allows the next steps to occur. So even though we're in 2012, we still segregate ourselves by this category called race in where we live, where we worship, where we go to school. So we're going to look at that. So here's Milwaukee. Milwaukee's such a clear case where... I felt like coming from the airport, I'm halfway to Milwaukee right now, so I use Milwaukee. But what this is showing is neighborhoods in the whole metropolitan region of Milwaukee. This means 
that these are African-American neighborhoods. And it's very clear. If you're African-American in Milwaukee, you live here, you don't live here. And they are a Latino neighborhood or neighborhoods here. So it's very segregated spatially in terms of residences. Of course, we're all interested in Chicago. Chicago, much bigger, but you still, as you probably know, as you go into Gary and these areas, African-American, South, uh, also the west side of Chicago, we have huge Latino areas as well. Very few uh, Asian majority areas. And where are we right now? We're right there. And these are white areas. The darkest means, uh, it's supposed to mean 85% or more. Color looks a little off. Why does it matter? Because when I teach my students, they always say, but people live where they want to live. They can choose where they want to live. Big deal. The reason it matters is when we actually look at the effects. So what I'm going to show you in this chart are people who are poor, living in urban America or suburban America. It's in urban metropolitan areas. By race. So everybody on here is poor. But we're looking at what kind of neighborhood do you live in by race if you are poor. So that's what this is. So if you are white and you are poor, the most common neighborhood that you live in is a non-poor neighborhood, meaning that the people around you, less than 20% are poor. And then, of course, if you're black or Hispanic, what do you find? You find the exact opposite. The most common experience if you're poor and black or Hispanic is that at least 40% of the people around you are also poor. That creates a whole different reality even of being poor. So again, if you were going to be poor, it's better off being white and poor. You have better access to better schools, better services, and so on because you're typically located in non-poor neighborhoods. This happens because of two reasons. Higher poverty rates for black and Hispanic, and the key linchpin is then segregating by race, because then you force that higher poverty into categories of race. So if we didn't have racial segregation, we would all share in the same poverty rate. So if we didn't have racial segregation or economic segregation, we'd all live in exact same kind of neighborhoods. If we add in racial segregation, we get this, very different realities for people. It also matters in here. This is until the uh, collapse a few years ago. We typically, you buy a house, it goes up in value, and you get to sell the house and you make money. When I lived in Minneapolis uh, in the 90s, this was a chart that was made that looked at the change in housing value over the five years that we were living there. And if you see red or orange, these are areas that actually declined in housing value over that period. The red has lost 10% of its value. The orange is 5 to 10%. If you are in the green, you're making money, as you would expect. And yellow meant no change in the housing value. If you overlay racial concentration, these circles are where ethnic minorities live. They're the ones losing their money. They're sitting in houses just like everybody else, but by being there, their houses are going down in value. We, well, follow the bouncing ball, that's where we lived. When we sold our house, we lost 10% of the value. My point here is always, it doesn't matter who I am individually. This is not an individual issue, this is a social issue. I did not play by the rules. I'm supposed to live in these neighborhoods. I chose to live there, so I will have the same result. Living in a, this was a particularly African American community, then I will lose value, and we did. So here's a study going back to Milwaukee. This was a really detailed study. It takes a long time, because you have to go through every house bought and sold from 1971 to 1993. And here's what is the findings. So they said, for whites and blacks, if in 1971 your home was worth 40000 what was it then worth in 1993? This isn't made up data, this is what it actually was. Okay, so for whites and blacks. So for whites, their average home was worth $250,000 over that period. So just by living in the house, they made, you know, 200 plus thousand dollars. Blacks living in their house was worth 32,000. So see that what's happening because of racial segregation. And this happens because demand for white neighborhoods is much more, drives up the value. An economist asked the question, how much are whites willing to pay to live in white neighborhoods? And the answer was, there is no upper limit. They will pay infinite amount more to be in a white neighborhood, in part because they get this result. All right, here's our current neighborhood. Um, I went to the census, 
And our current neighbor is 80% African American, 16% Latino, 4% other. This is where my family and I live. We are getting sent by our, my employer to Copenhagen, Denmark. So we have to put up our house for sale. We have to be there for a year, then we'll come back. We need to downsize our house. So we put up for sale. So let me show you what has happened. So when we purchased the home, we actually had it built there in 2006. We paid $273,000. We put it up for sale. We were able to get a sales agreement in September for $225,000. Now, we've been doing this long enough that we thought, this isn't such a bad deal because that's about what we owe on it, so at least we can break even and be able to make the deal happen. So we uh, were going to close the deal. We moved everything out of the house. We moved to a little apartment where we'll be until we head to Copenhagen. And two days before the closing, the appraisal finally came back. What the house is actually worth and what you can get a bank loan for. This is what they said our house is worth. So the house has dropped in value $113,000. Can't sell it because we, we couldn't afford to sell it. Buyers aren't going to be willing to pay the difference between what we owe. And so, and this is, we're seeing this in our neighborhood across. Foreclosures, houses that were middle class, African American and Hispanic are turning to becoming rentals and the neighborhood changes. Yeah, so we already said that, okay. The implications nationally then are this. In 2002, black median net worth, everything you owe minus everything you own. What do you got left? For African Americans, $6,000. Hispanics, $8,000. Whites, $90,000. And most of that can come just from the value of your housing increasing. So the ratio between white and Hispanics in the U.S., whites on, on 2002 had 11 and a quarter times more wealth. Notice that in 1988, it was 10 times, so it grew, not got less. And if we look at the white-black ratio, it's 15 times. Back in 1988, it was 11.8, so it got bigger too. We can look at this again. There's an, a really good study that comes out of the University of Michigan. They've been following the same 2,000 black and white families, in this case, from 84 to 2007. And they go into great detail to track wealth. And here's what they found has happened over that period. A fourfold increase in the gap. And if we chart it, it looks like this. So black income has increased, or, or wealth has increased ever so slightly over this period, but you can see what's happened for white Americans. Again, big part is housing segregation leads to increases in home values, but it's also the way that we make money. If you invest the same and each make 5%, if I invest 10000 and and another person invests $10, I make more than you, even though we have the same return, because I started with more. This is serious stuff. As of 2012, the gaps are now this. Whites have, on average, 50% more wealth than Asians, 18 times more than Hispanics, and 20 times more than African Americans. In a colorblind society, we're not going to talk about it. This will go unchecked, and every time we look, it will get bigger and bigger and bigger because of the way the system is set up. So this is a major issue for us, increasing wealth gaps. And I'll come back to that in a little bit. Okay, let's go to our churches. So in 1998, we did a survey to look if churches were racially mixed or homogenous. And we defined racially mixed as 20% or more of the congregation being another racial group. Um, to save time, I won't go into why, but there is a lot of research why 20% is the magical cutoff. So if we take all congregations, no matter what the faith tradition, in 98, 7% were racially mixed, 93% were not. We were able to redo this in 2007, and this is what we found. Ah, nothing changed. We're doing it again in 2012, and I'm hoping perhaps something will change, but we won't know until we get the data. It does matter what kind of church or tradition you're in. So the least likely to be integrated are Protestant congregations. Catholics are three times as likely to have racially mixed churches, and then mosques, you know, almost 70% are racially mixed. Um, sociologists, we try to say, well, why is that, and then use numbers, and one variable accounts for why this difference, and it is what we call religious market share. The more congregations you have within your faith tradition, the more segregated you will be because you're giving people more choices and they choose to be with people like themselves. So Protestants have way more choices than do Catholics. And then, of course, just as an example, in um, 
the Houston region, there are about 6,000 Protestant congregations. There are about 400 Catholic, and there are 84 mosques. How segregated are U.S. congregations? So let's put that into a context. What we did is that we compared to the churches, to the uh, neighborhoods they sat in, and then to the school districts they were in. And when we did that, we found that the congregations are 10 times less diverse than the neighborhoods they're sitting in. So yes, churches are segregated and homogenous because they are often not in diverse neighborhoods, but if they just reflected their neighborhoods, we would have an explosion of diversity in our congregations. And if they reflected their school districts, then even more, 20 times less diverse than their schools that they're in, the public schools. So the next step is incarcerate. And this is one I missed for many years until I read this book, The New Jim Crow. I love the subtitle, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colorblindness. So she's already picking up that with colorblindness, you can have what happens here. So I'm just going to quickly show you. So some changes that have come through our criminal justice system starting in about 1980, we created a war on drugs, which was in a reaction to what happened in the 60s. There was a lot of dialogue going on in Washington and elsewhere that we have people like Martin Luther King out there saying, we can decide which laws to obey and which laws not to obey. That isn't going to make a society work. We've got to have law and order. And out of this law and order came, we will create a war on drugs starting in the 1980 or so. Mandatory sentencing for drug possession. Instead of getting treatment, you get sentenced. So what's happened since 1980? The number of annual drug arrests has tripled. The number who are um, resulting in a prison sentence has quadrupled. And there's been a 1,100% increase in the population in prison for drug offenses. So it means that in 1980, we had 300,000 Americans in prison, and now we have 2.3 million Americans in prison. To put that number in context, no society on earth, as far as we know, has ever had that many people in prison. That's more than double any other place on earth, including China. And the rate is about triple any other place on earth. It means that there are more than 7 million Americans have been behind bars on probation or on parole currently, and over this time, 31 million drug arrests have happened. Okay, so that's one thing, but it's, is there are racial implications here? So let's start with two facts. Whites are the majority of drug users because they're the most people, but in terms of rates, across all groups, it seems like the rates are similar except for one group. White youth are the most likely to use drugs at the highest rate. In terms of what's happened, though, and who gets caught and put in prison, black men are sent to prison on drug offenses 13 times the rate of white men. 75% of all the people in prison for drug offenses, black or Latino. Here's what's changed since 1983, and you'll see everybody goes to prison a lot more, no matter what group. And this is government reporting. So whites are eight times more likely to go to prison than they were back in 1980. Latinos, 22 times more likely. And African Americans, 26 times more likely. Here's the implication. Black and Hispanic men under 35, born since the 1980, a third of them will be behind bars on probation or on parole at some point in their life. If they don't graduate high school, 70% will go to prison. Now, just think of this from a Christian perspective of trying to have family life, trying to do church, when you have so many men just removed from the system. Also, here are some implications if you have a a felony drug offense or if you've been imprisoned. You cannot get student loans. So when you get out, you can't be applying for government loans to try and go to college. You can't live in public housing. You cannot serve on juries. You will wait at least 12 years to be able to vote. Of course, you, do, you know, having a prison record, it makes it pretty tough to get a job. And certain kind of jobs you just never will get. You're much more likely to be sent back to prison. And that's really changed since 1980 because of these restrictions here. So we create a whole margin of people. that They're perpetually at the margins of society. They're never quite again, fully American. We can say, well, they deserve it or they don't, but that's the case. We have millions of people who are at the margins. Um, The conclusion of that book I showed you, the cover, she says, you're better off if you were black or Hispanic having lived in old Jim Crow than the new Jim Crow in terms of being able to provide for your family, that it's actually gotten worse in her perspective. And the final step is that we alienate. So, for example, we say illegal alien, not illegal immigrant. It's part of the alienation process. We actually have a national telephone survey experiment going on where half the people that we reach by phone are reading a question, getting a set of questions in which we use illegal alien, and half, and this is computer-generated, who gets it, 
are getting illegal immigrant. And we want to see if just using, changing one word makes a difference. So we have, of course, this huge immigration issues. It's so controversial that you know, even in the presidential election, they do their best to avoid talking about it. And I'm not going to go through all this, but when we have the policy that we do, and this is basically that we're going to, we need workers, but we're not going to provide work visas, so then people come across illegally, which means things like no driver's license, filling up hospitals, the IR, because they can't go anywhere else, and so on. Okay, so this is like the depressing part, right? Decolorate, segregate, incarcerate, alienate. Now, one more thing, and here's the, the, to me the full implication of it. This is where we took what we call social problems and made it one index. And what's part of the social problem index? How much do people in the society trust one another? What's the rate of mental illness, the rate of substance addiction, life expectancy, infant mortality, obesity rates, educational performance, teen births, homicide rate, and then map it according to the level of inequality, economic inequality in a society. And when we did that, we took 32 developed nations, we get a line like this. So the lowest amount of ec income inequality and the lowest amount of these social problems is Japan. Very homogenous society. And you see all the ones clustered here are homogenous. The Scandinavian countries, Finland, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Belgium, Netherlands, Austria, Germany, Spain, France, Canada, Switzerland, Ireland. We're just mapping their level of income inequality on their score on this social problem index, and they follow along here. Italy, Australia, New Zealand, the UK, Portugal, and the US. So what's interesting about the US is not only that we have the highest income inequality in the developed world, or that we have the most social problems, but that that relationship it changes only for us. It goes up higher and faster than it should, given our level. And a big part of that that we found is because of our inability to deal with racial issues. It causes us to not even be on the same plane as these. Okay, so what do we do? We said this is how race works and what it means for the church. I love this quote from Martin Luther King. We will be greatly misled if we feel that the race problem will work itself out. Structures of evil do not crumble by passively waiting. Evil must be attacked by a counteracting persistence by the day-to-day -day assault of the battering rams of justice. What's exciting here is this. The, God has given the church a work. It is to be a battering ram against all this stuff I just showed you. That we are to be fighting evil in any form it is, and in the United States and many places, a huge expression of that evil is race. The way that we divide. So just a couple of strategies for trying to heal the brokenness. One is that we determine that one of our roles as religious organizations, be us here, be us congregations, be parachurch organizations, is to work for justice and reconciliation. We're working for individual conversion. We're also working for our communities to look and reflect God's presence. We have to work across level and type. So let me show you what I mean here. Okay, so I grew up um, very white evangelical. And for me, if you told me I got to change things, I would immediately say, well, I got to have people, gotta, I got to convert people. Right? And I got to get heart change. And that is very important. But notice that that's, I'm focusing on that change comes from individuals and, in this case, internal, like in my own congregation. But there are three other ways. And if you're going to do the battering rams of justice, we got to hit on all fronts. So we can still focus on the individual level. And we see, do see these. There's, these are just possibilities, educational training, job assistance. But we're going to have to hit at this level, too, the structures that exist that cause a lot of what we just saw. I've been writing forever, and I know many of you as well. We have got to diversify our organizations, our Christian organizations, or we're not going to be able to work together to do it. And just diversifying our organizations is part of tearing apart this system of how race works. It's putting a big dent into the color walls. Uh, these are some other things that we create a theology of justice. Uh, I've seen this happen, and I've seen churches work. I'm thinking in particular in Cincinnati, where they... 
I and Michelle Alexander spoke at a conference. They found in research that there were 600 laws in Ohio that cause differential rates of who goes to prison, that causes black and Hispanics in Ohio to go to prison at a higher rate. And the churches came, they signed a document, and in one swoop, they were able, working through the uh, state legislator, to get 300 of those laws removed. Just did that a few months ago. So that's kind of advocating for changes in criminal justice laws. Might work for immigration reform that makes sense. So finally, Trinity is our key. So in the Trinity, we know we get unity and diversity. It's always the most puzzling, mysterious thing. We have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. It's, we, we struggle, we study to figure it out, but that's our key. I think that's why God is that, to teach us how we are supposed to be able to relate to one another. So, And I want to emphasize that we can never go alone. We have to be part of a, a movement together doing this. Okay, so what we do not want to be is right here. You all are being trained to be leaders, and this is what a leader does. All right. With our training, with the... I mean, what I love about the Bible is we get to see the end and we win, right? So anything that is of evil will pass away. We get to be part of trying to be the battering rams against it. And so we are in many ways unstoppable. 